done. Now, just by way of introduction, I'd like to mention a well-known rugby league coach by the name of Wayne Bennett. Coached the Brisbane Broncos for many years, came to the Illawarra for three years, I think it was, and now he's in sunny Newcastle. Wayne Bennett's team, the Broncos, had a bit of a reputation of starting the season by losing a number of matches. And he was often criticised for that. And when he was criticised, sometimes he would say something along these lines. There's only one match that matters in the end, and that's the grand final. And so it is in life as well. It's not so important how we begin our lives. It's much more important how we end our lives. Many people begin well, but they do not finish well. And so today, I want to look at King Joash and compare him with the priest, the high priest, who was uh, ruling at that time, Jehoiada. And by comparing these two men, I hope that we can learn some good lessons from this passage. First of all, just a bit of background. You'll remember Jehoshaphat. And if you've got your uh, outline uh, here today with you, you'll find it helpful. You'll remember Jehoshaphat, uh, king of Judah, the fourth king of Judah, was a good king, but he was somewhat foolish in some ways. He compromised greatly by allowing, or perhaps even encouraging, his son Jehoram to marry the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And so Jehoram married Athaliah, that wicked Baal-worshipping woman, the daughter of Jezebel. Jehoram only reigned for eight years, and then the Lord struck him with a terrible disease, and he died. His son, Ahaziah, only reigned for one year, and he was killed by the Syrians in battle. But his own mother saw opportunity. Athaliah rose up. She killed all of her grandsons that she could find, the heirs to the throne, and she seized power in Judah. Do you remember the Lord's prophecy? Uh, way back in Genesis chapter 3, speaking to the serpent there, he said, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life and I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What was happening here with Athaliah killing her grandsons was the serpent bruising the heel of the seed of, of Eve. Indeed, the devil is constantly trying to destroy the work of God. We have this also spoken about, remember, in Psalm 2, where we read, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Continually, there are people in power and authority who set themselves against God and against his anointed. Why do we not hear the name of Muhammad used as a blasphemous swear word? Why do we not hear the name of Buddha used as a, a term of exclamation when people are frustrated? Why is it the names of God and of Christ and of Jesus are used, it is because of the absolute enmity that there is between the world and our Christ. And so since the beginning, the evil one's been trying to destroy the Messiah. He tried with the Jewish babies being killed in Egypt. Remember when Pharaoh said, if it's a male born, kill him, throw him in the river. He tried when Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go, when Moses said, look, just let our people go out into the, into the wilderness, just a couple of days' journey, and Pharaoh would not. He tried when King David fell into grievous sin, 
and the whole monarchy was threatened. He tried when David's son rose up against him, when Absalom rebelled against him and tried to kill his own father. He tried when the kingdom was divided because of the foolishness of Rehoboam. He is now attempting again in the time of Joash, king of Israel. But remember what Psalm 2 goes on to say. It says there, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God is working his purposes out. And the wicked designs of men and women, kings and queens, cannot stop his eternal plan from being executed. And so we read, if you go with me back to chapter 22, we didn't read from uh, chapter 22, but if you look back at chapter 22 and uh, there in verse 10. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, when she, when she saw that Ahaziah was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeth, uh, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with him in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. So often in the Christian life, in the history of Christian churches, so often all seems to be lost, doesn't it? And God intervenes at what seems to us to be the 11th hour or the last minute. It's not the last minute for God, of course. It's the time that he is predetermined from before the foundation of the world when he will act. And so often in God's wisdom, he acts just when all human help seems to be exhausted. The Lord works and uh, this is his pattern so that he shall have the glory, not sinful men and women having the glory. So let's look briefly at these two men. Well, first of all, Jehoiada the priest. Note that he was the high priest and note that he had ruled for many years. He was now 90 years old when Joash was crowned as king. So don't think that you're too old to do anything in serving the Lord. And this is not in the days when men lived six, seven, eight hundred years. He died at the age of 130. But at the age of 90, he was used in this way. Because he'd ruled for such a long time, he had seen now seven different rulers in Judah. If you go back uh, to your chart, you see that the first seven rulers of Judah that Jehoiada had lived uh, as a high priest through all of their reigns. He was an experienced man. He knew what had been happening in the kingdom. And we see that he was a married man. He was married to this woman, uh, I find it hard to pronounce her name, Jehoshabeth. She was the daughter of King Jehoram, and so she was of royal blood. But more importantly, we see that she was a godly woman. Proverbs 31 says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Now, if you're single, it's not up to me to tell you whether you should marry or not. That's very much your own decision between you and the Lord. But if you are going to marry, if you're a man, then you need to marry a godly woman. If you're a woman, you should think about marrying a godly man because charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain or passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And praise God, Jehoiada did marry a truly godly woman, as we'll see by her actions. He was also a brave man. 
He was probably the one who encouraged his wife to steal away this little child of, uh, when, when uh, Athaliah was running through the land trying to kill all of the heirs, murdering her own grandchildren. You can imagine what Athaliah would have done to Jehoiada if she'd found out that he and his wife were keeping an heir to the throne in their own house. Both Jehoiada and his wife were indeed very brave people to keep a little child. We know what it's like trying to keep a child quiet during a meeting or in a time of worship or if we dare to take them to the movies. Imagine trying to keep a little child quiet day after day after day. And I mean, everybody would have known that he was missing. I mean, you don't just think, oh, yes, there were about six or seven grandchildren. Everybody knew exactly how many. And the murderers knew exactly how many they had found and killed. There was one missing. Where could he be? What has happened to him? They kept him quiet hidden for these six years. If you're going to serve Christ, you need to be brave because you will find obstacles and uh, hardships and dangers along the way. Jehoiada and his wife were brave as they served the living God. We see too that he was patient. For six years, he and his wife hid the little boy until he was old enough and there was probably another reason that he waited the six years. Probably waited for these six years so that the people were utterly sick and tired of Athaliah and her wicked reign. And so for six years, he and his wife patiently cared for and hid this little boy. We all know, don't we, that oftentimes the waiting is worse than the actual procedure. Ask anybody who's got a dental appointment and has to have a root canal therapy or something like that. Ask anyone who's got to go and see a specialist about their heart condition or their possible diagnosis of cancer or some other life-threatening illness. The waiting is often worse than the procedure, isn't it? And I'm sure that the waiting, the constant waiting for Jehoiada and his wife was indeed a very trying time. If you're a believer, God will make you wait. He makes us wait very often for our own good because it's during the waiting that our faith or lack of faith is showed up for what it is. And he was wise. We heard about wisdom in the prayer meeting this morning. Jehoiada was wise. Note how when the time came, when, when Joash is six years old, and we're up to chapter 23 now, there in verse 1, <coughs> that he made a covenant with the officers in the army. In the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself, and he made a covenant with the captains of hundreds, Azariah the son of Jer Jeraham, Ishmael the son of Jehonanan, Azariah the son of Obed, Messiah the son of Adiah, and Elishaphat the son of Zikri. He knew that he needed to have all of the army on side if he was going to depose wicked Athaliah. He also gathered together all the Levites and the leaders. Look in verse 2. And they went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the chief fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. You see, this crowning of King Joash did not just happen within five minutes. There was a lot of prayer a lot of preparation going into this occasion. And then he made a covenant with the people, verse 3. He knew that he needed to get the people on side. And I want to ask you, is that the way that you go about your Christian life? Because not everyone, and sadly not even all Christians, go about their life in this way. There are many people, some that I know well and some not so well, who are lone rangers. They have their own way of doing things 
They find it difficult to work as part of a team. They find it difficult to adapt to the ways of others. There's my way of doing it and that's the best way. They won't say it as bluntly uh, as that, of course, but as you begin to try to work with such people, it's their way or no way at all. What about you? Are you a lone ranger? Do you do things in your life? That can be just the way that you do the dishes at home, the way you park the car. It can be the way you do the housework or manage your finances, the way that you drive your car, the way you lead prayer meetings in your home. Has it just got to be your way or no other way at all? Jehoiada was not like that. He knew that he needed to work with the people, the captains of the army, the Levites, the leaders of the church, and the people in general. He was a team player. And then too we see that he was holy. Jehoiada was a holy man. Verse 6, he says, But let no one come into the house of the Lord except the priests and those of the Levites who serve. You see, for the previous, what was it, 15 years, there'd been Baal worship in the land and people had forgotten about the ways of God. They had forgotten, many of them, that the temple was restricted. The inner, inner parts of the temple were restricted and the people could not enter in. And so he asked them to honour this. He said, only the priests and those of the Levites can come in. They may go in for they are holy. That is, they have prepared themselves for this occasion. But all the people shall keep the watch of the Lord. Jehoiada had a real concern for God's commandments, for the way that God should be worshipped. And again, we all need to think about this. Do I really, really get concerned about the way that I should worship God? in my own home and in public with the congregation as well? Am I concerned that our worship of God should be according to the way that God has commanded? Over recent years we've had a number of messages about the regulative principle, that's what it's called, worshipping God the way that he has commanded and not just oh, whatever I feel like doing on the day, which is our natural inclination, isn't it? And so Jehoiada was a holy man who had a concern for the holiness of God. And note even in verse 14, when the deed has been done and Athaliah, uh, or when Joash has been crowned and Athaliah is uh, crying out, treason, treason! Notice what he says there in verse 14. He says, don't kill her in the house of the Lord. He knew that this would desecrate the house of God for even this wicked Athaliah to be killed in the temple of the Lord. What about you? Do you care about the house of God like Jehoiada did? Do you care about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as he did? And then too we see that he loved the word of God. Look at verse 11. He went and they brought out the, the boy, King Joash. They put the crown on him and they gave him... The testimony. They gave him a copy, probably it was the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. They gave him a copy of the Bible. Jehoiada commanded that should be done. He had a love for the Word of God. I want you to do something right now. Just close your Bible. Close it up. And I want you to think, when's the next time, apart from the rest of this sermon, when's the next time you're going to open your Bible? You're going to open it next Sunday morning if you're at worship? Will you open it tonight? Will you open it tomorrow morning? When is the next time you're going to open your Bible? You might say, oh, I love the Word of God and I love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when it comes to the crunch, When's the next time you're really going to open your Bible and listen to what God is saying to you? We see that he was a good teacher also. He obviously had taught young 
Joash, all the days of his life, the six years of his life. He was the priest. That was his responsibility because we read that when uh, Joash uh, became king, that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Joash was taught well by Jehoiada, who was really his adopted father or his stepfather, wasn't he? Because he lived in his house. We see too that he was well loved by the people. When he died, he was actually buried with the kings. We know that in uh, Australia, when there's someone who dies, who, who's not, not royalty or not, uh, not perhaps a politician even, but somebody who is well loved by the people, sometimes the government makes a decision. We'll give them a state funeral. And that's what happened with Jehoiada. They gave him a state funeral. And his body was buried alongside the other kings of Judah. And... Uh, alongside the bodies of Solomon and David. What a wonderful testimony to the godliness of this man. And we see too that he was a faithful father. He had a number of sons, and one of the sons was Zechariah. And Zechariah obviously walked in the footsteps of his own father. If you go with me to chapter 24 and look at verse 20. This is after Jehoiada has uh, died. And uh, Zechariah, chapter 24, verse 20. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, who stood above the people. And he said to them, Thus says God, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? And for all of us who have been married or are still married, this is our great desire, isn't it? That our sons and our daughters, every single one of them, should walk in the ways that we have walked. And even better, that they should walk in the ways of God. And so here is this high priest, Jehoiada, married to a godly woman. He's a brave man. He's a wise man. He's a godly man. He loves the word of God. He's a holy man. He's taught uh, well, he's loved by the people and he has taught his sons well and raised them in the ways of God. Jehoiada lived well, he started well and he died well. He finished the race well. Let's now look at Joash, the king. Go with me to chapter 24 and verse 2. Chapter 24 and 2, we see that he began well. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Note that qualification there. All the days of Jehoiada the priest. The writer is letting us know, isn't he, that there is something yet to come. Verse 4, right through to verse 13, document how he actually repaired the temple. He commanded the monies to come in and it didn't come in at first, so they came up with another idea. They got a big wooden chest with a hole in it and encouraged people to bring their offerings for the repair of the temple of the Lord. That's a good beginning, isn't it? Especially for a boy king who was under the tutelage of Jehoiada, the high priest but it appears that he feared man more than he feared God. It seems that all of Joash's works were done not to please God, but to please Jehoiada and his adopted mother too. A name that I can hardly pronounce. And there, there we see a particular danger. That if you, like Joash, if you have been brought up in a Christian home, it is so easy, so easy to just please or want to please mum and dad rather than to please God. It appears that this is what happened with Joash. 
He didn't really love God. He didn't really fear God. He loved Jehoiada and uh, his mother, but it appears he didn't really love God. Now I say this because there's a number of you here today, many of us in fact, who've been brought up in godly Christian homes, taught the word of God, encouraged to pray, to worship the Lord, to repent of your sin, to turn unto Christ. And if you've been brought up in a godly home, praise God. Those of us like myself who didn't have that privilege, I see how much we've missed out on. You don't realize the wonderful blessing that it is to be brought up in a home where your father doesn't bash your mother. This is not referring to my family. Where your father is not an alcoholic coming home blind drunk week after week. Where there's always food on the, on the table. You don't have to be scratching around for food. Some in my extended family have been like that. Plenty of money for cigarettes and alcohol and gambling, but little money for food on the table. If you've been brought up in a godly home, you ought to thank God every day of your life. And the way to show your gratitude is not just to say thank you to mum and dad, but to thank God every single day of your life. And so if you've been brought up in a godly home, I am encouraged that you are here today. But I want you to really ask of yourself, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Am I here because I really want to be? Because I want to know about God and about Christ? I want to know what God teaches me? Or are you here, as is so easy to do, because it's expected of you, or because you hope that it will please your grandparents, or it might please your mum and your dad, or your uncles and aunts, whoever you've got in this church, or maybe in another church. Some years ago, I witnessed a young person, a young girl, raised in a godly home, trying desperately to please her parents. It was almost unbelievable how desperate this young girl was to please her parents. It was embarrassing. But sadly, when she came of age, left home, she has turned away very much from the faith. Not permanently, I hope and trust. And so I still pray for that young woman. So ask yourself, what am I doing here today? Why am I here? We see too that about Joash that he departed from the truth. That is, he became an apostate. Many of us, particularly we older ones, have heard many sermons on apostasy. And uh, those terrible apostates they teach in Bible colleges and they do this and they do that and they lead people away from the truth. That's what an apostate is. Someone who simply departs from the truth. And if you've known the truth and been taught the truth and you turn away from the truth, it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what position you've got in life, you are or are becoming an apostate. That's just what it means. Joash forgot God's mercies. He forgot the kindness of Jehoiada and his wife. You know, in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, we're told five or six times about the dangers of turning away from the truth. And one of those uh, times is in chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, he says... Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Notice what he says, beware, brethren, those whom he counts as brothers, those who are professing Christ. He's not talking to pagans. He's talking to people in the church 
He says, beware, be careful, lest in any of you there be an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today. That just means do it today, do it tomorrow, do it the next day. Just keep on doing it. Keep on warning one another, exhorting one another, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Don't let your heart be hardened. The world promises much, but delivers little. The world will promise you <clears throat> 70 or 80 years of pleasure, but in the end, if you do not have Christ, what will you have? You will regret not having Christ forever and ever and ever in hell. Joash became an apostate. He saw God's mercy many times. Look at verse 19, chapter 24, and verse 19 we read there. Yet he, that is God, sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not listen. Note those words, but they would not listen. And Joash was one of those who would not listen. We've got evidence that he wouldn't listen because of what's recorded in verses 20 and 21. Turn with me to chapter 24 and verse 20 and 21. The Spirit of God came upon Zechariah. Remember, Zechariah is the godly son of Jehoiada. Jehoiada's has died now and he's the son of Jehoiada the priest and he stood above the people he got up on some sort of a platform where everybody could see him and he said to them thus says God why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so you can't prosper because you've forsaken the Lord he's also forsaken you so what did they do? They conspired against him after this sermon that Zechariah has given they got together in their little huddles and said, what can we do about this man? And at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. In the holy place, the house of the Lord, they stoned him with stones at the command of King Joash. That's what Joash did to repay the kindness that had been shown to him. You see how he hated Zechariah. I want you, again, just to imagine. Imagine you're an adopted child. Your own parents have been killed, so you're an orphan. And you're adopted by a loving couple who take you in and they raise you and then they grow old because they're quite an elderly couple. They grow old and die. And they have other sons and daughters. And the way that you show your gratitude to those adopted parents of yours is you kill one of their own sons. See, that's what Joash did. You see how much of an apostate he was? And to make it even worse, he killed him in the temple, in the very place where he had been taught by Jehoiada so many times. Well, what happened to Joash? Well, he was judged by God, wasn't he? God did not forget the death of Zechariah. We read in Matthew 23, many years later, in Matthew 23, where the Lord Jesus is rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. And just listen to what he says. He says that on you, that is you scribes and Pharisees, on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel, right back in Genesis, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, that's another name for Jehoiada, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. You see, the Lord Jesus in condemning the scribes and the Pharisees, says, God is going to repay upon you all the blood that you have shed 
over the centuries from the time of Abel through to the blood of Zechariah. You see, when God's servants are killed, God doesn't turn a blind eye. God doesn't forget. We read about that in Revelation 6 too. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And so God sent judgment upon Joash. Joash was wounded in battle. And notice what it says there in verse 23 and 24, that when God sent the Syrians down to fight against Joash and his army, what did God send? He sent a small army. A very small army was able to defeat them. A very small army was able to wound Joash. And he was so despised by his own servants because of what he had done to Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, that his own servants rose up and killed him. He was murdered, assassinated by his own people. And then Joash, sadly, produced a son who was much like him. Jehoiada had produced a son just like him. And now Joash produces a son much like him. In chapter 25, we read about his son Amaziah, verse 1 and 2. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoaddan of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. Sadly, Amaziah was a man who began well, but he didn't finish well either. Brethren, Remember the sayings of the football coach. Remember what Wayne Bennett says. It's not how you start the season. There's only one match that matters. It's the grand final. The same sort of thing is often said in an election year, and we are in an election year, aren't we? When politicians are asked about the polls, Oh, you see that you're down 2% in the polls this week, Miss Gillard, or you're up 1%, Mr Abbott. Some wise politicians say, well, there's only one poll that matters, and that's on election day. And so we need to be wise. Remember the parable that Jesus told that teaches us all about this, the parable of the sower. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he cast out the seed, remember some fell on the footpath, some fell on the stony ground, and some fell on the ground that was full of weeds, and some fell on the good ground. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. If you've grown up in a godly home, when you get your own car and your own pocket full of money that you've earned, it's a very dangerous time because the deceitfulness of riches can choke the word of God that's in your heart and you can become like Joash, an apostate, one who knew the truth but deliberately turns away from the truth. Don't be like Joash. Be like Jehoiada, who began well and finished well. Amen.